and welcome back to Paleocast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is episode 85, Ichthyosaurs. We've got no introduction today because I'm actually sat here with Dr. Benjamin Moon and Theon Smithick and we can just put the episode into context right here and now. So, These two chaps are both researchers at the University of Bristol with myself, and they have a keen interest in ichthyosaurs. So, Fian, I'll go age before beauty. Can you tell us all about how you started on the path to being a paleontologist? I can indeed. So, I have always always had a keen interest in paleontology and natural history. Um, I grew up down on the Jurassic Coast, so I I had the beaches as my uh, my back garden to go and collect fossils on. But I didn't get into paleontology academically until a little bit later on, so in my mid-twenties after becoming a landscape gardener and various other regular regular style jobs, and then decided that I wanted to get back into natural history and paleontology and decided to go to the University of Bristol to study it. So how did your friends and family take that? I mean, you were there working a a normal job by any standards and Relatively. all of a sudden you were just like, right, I've had enough of this. I'm going off to be a paleontologist. <laughs> down tools one day and off to university. That was it. Well, I don't think my parents were particularly surprised because I always had that keen interest. My brother was slightly more because I was actually also in a band with him at the time, which was quite a big thing. Um, we had a, a record deal. We were going, going around touring all the time. So me dropping out of that to go into academia was more of an issue than dropping out of my uh, regular day job. He's just about forgiving me now. (laughs) What was your band called? Did it have a particularly uh, paleontologically inspired name? Uh, We were called Second Smile, and I'm struggling to link that in anywhere. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there was a good reason for it originally. And if we were to form a band right now, I know some people who are actually musicians. I mean, Joe Keating, Paleocast Joe Keating, he's a singer. Uh, Luke Parry, who may be appearing on this show, is a guitarist. If you... a bassist? I think he plays bass. Bass? Okay. Well, Maybe he plays bass. I think he <laughs> but, plays everything. But if you were to form your own paleontological band right now, what would you call them? Ooh. Ooh, that's, that's putting me on the spot. It's going to have, have to be something to do with rocks, isn't it? Or rock. <laughs> yeah. would, it would it be a rock cliche. band? Yeah. No, no. I think your first <laughs> single would be the Fossil Shop Rock, though, wouldn't it? Yes. It is now. Get a, get a, <laughs> it is now. Get a nice yeah. bit of 12 bars going in there. I think I think this is the start of something beautiful. Okay, so if you weren't a paleontologist, would you still be landscape gardening? Um, potentially. It was it was a good, fun job. I enjoyed it. I've always been very outdoorsy, so going out fossil hunting as a child, get, becoming a landscape gardener. Um, these days when I'm not um, working in paleontology, I'm out collecting fossils and things like that. So it all, I think I would be doing something outdoorsy generally in natural history, but I have no idea if it wasn't paleontology. And how good is your fossil finding record? It's getting better these days. I try and get out as often as I can, as I said, in um, when I'm not working. Um, and I've had uh, I've had some reasonable luck over the years. So I've I've been lucky enough to find my own ichthyosaurs, um, mostly down at Lyme Regis, um, where the one for this show was found. Um, and I, I learned quite a few of my uh, fossil hunting techniques from Chris Moore himself, the guy who found the fossil and stars in the new show. Yeah. And what would you say is the single best fossil you've ever found? Single best fossil, I have a juvenile ichthyosaur that's pretty much 100% complete, which is pretty rare because on an eroding coast where I find them down at Lyme Regis, finding a complete animal that hasn't lost part of the body to erosion is pretty uncommon. And do you research ichthyosaurs as well? Is that what you're doing at the university? So I'm doing a number of different things during my PhD. Um, it's focusing on paleo colour, so looking at colour in extinct animals, reconstructing those colours, and then using the reconstructed colours to work out things about the ecology and potential behaviours of these animals. And I'm not working specifically on ichthyosaurs, but I am working on them as part of the remit of the PhD as one of a number of projects. So I have been looking at them and their soft tissue preservation. Okay. And Ben, uh, pretty much the same questions to you. Uh, How did you become a paleontologist? Well, I've always, in a similar manner to Fian, I've always been interested in uh, natural history, paleontology specifically, um, ever since, I guess, the age of three and getting my first dinosaur book, which I still have on my bookshelf somewhere. 
Um, and it just sort of spiraled down and down from there, really. So getting all of the dinosaur books that I could get my hand on, often often at Christmas or birthdays, there would be a, a new one to unwrap. Um, and that never really left me. I came of age in the rather fortunate time of walking with dinosaurs um, and uh, walking with beasts and all of those other sort of um, state-of-the-art, at least for the time, natural history documentaries on the the BBC and having this new CGI set of dinosaurs, mammals and whatever else sitting in front of you just made me want to carry on and do that. And so um, that sort of was always the dream. That was what I was always planning for all the way through primary and secondary school, right the way up until finally getting into university to do a paleobiology degree at the University of Portsmouth. And similarly, what would you be doing if you weren't a paleontologist? Um, I'm not entirely certain. I think during secondary school, when they were doing all of this work experience stuff or choosing jobs, wherever you go into university or elsewhere, um, university was always the one I wanted to do and paleontology was always very much the first choice. There was various points um, at that time when I was very interested in uh, science more generally, I think, looking at um, physics would have been a potential alternative, either going somewhere along the particle physics, quantum physics route, or maybe looking at cosmology. So I guess to a certain extent, these are very much sort of scientifically research-based, pushing the extreme bounds of current knowledge, because that's just the sort of thing that I always like to do, whether that was at the very tiny scale or at the very large scale, or just with some old dead bones. You're going to be a quantum physicist. Could have been, yeah. Wow. Well, I could wasted, have been. You could have. Well, you are wasted in paleontology. I think, yeah, at the time, I because I did all of the sciences, chemistry, physics, maths, and further maths. So I didn't actually do biology at A level, um, but that meant I did a lot more maths than I have done since. So it's eked out a bit of it. But I always really liked maths and the sort of the simple beauty, not not always simple, but elegant beauty of it. So that was that was going to be an alternative. I think at some point I was also looking at music, but I was never really quite good enough at music to do the full um, conservatoire performing route. Would you have been good enough for Fiend's band? Uh, boy, Fiend was Too looking for probably. a tuba then. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for a tuba for years. <laughs> Can you tell us about the time when you represented the University of Bristol on University Challenge? <laughs> and what University Challenge is for people outside uh, of the UK? Yes, I can do, although it was starting to be on a few years ago now. So um, University Challenge is a quiz show on um, BBC UK Broadcaster. Um, it's, I guess it's one of the more famous ones, having been going for over 50 years now in total. And uh, I have a feeling that the year we were on was the 50th year because... While we were doing the training for the quiz, we were followed around, at least on occasion, by a film crew and the like, because they made an accompanying documentary for it. Um, so the idea behind it is that um, the universities of the UK apply to go in and uh, um, out of many, over 100 or so universities that are not apply initially, it's whittled down to 28 that then go head to head in a TV programme steadily knocking each other out in a series of fiendishly difficult questions, um, including both picture and music crowns, <laughs> um, to eventually uh, crown the, the victor of the smartest university in the UK, which is not to how they actually uh, publish it, but that's what many people think they do. Um, so yes, I think um, I was on the team, which was, oh, when was it on? either 2013 or 2014, I can't remember offhand which now, um, because um, it's all recorded about six months before the broadcasts go out. Um, so that was good fun. I met lots of nice people, Anastasia and Lewis and Miles and Robert, um, and we had a lot of fun asking each other the questions and having pizza nights and occasionally getting drunk with each other and all of that. Um, we did quite well um, getting through to the quarterfinals. Oh, you didn't win? No. All right, well, let's move on then. Well, I, th I think we did uh, equal best for any University of Bristol team. 
Oh, so far, good. anyway, the, there's a currently a team on this year as well. So, so what ranks smartest university is Bristol then? Thanks to you. Uh, mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> I think bungling mediocrity is probably the. That's, that's something to aspire to. Yes. Well, I speaking it almost every day. Yeah, I was going to say, speaking of bundling mediocrity, can you tell us about your research? Uh, so, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bristol. Um, so, I finished my PhD in late 2015 and have since been doing um, now about two thirds of the way through my postdoc. Um, I am actually a researcher on ichthyosaurs and so that has been my focus for the last six years now. Uh, In my PhD I was looking at the middle and late Jurassic ichthyosaurs primarily. So these are ichthyosaurs that uh, existed between around about 170 and 145 million years ago. Um, So I looked mostly at UK material, working out which species were there and describing the anatomy and morphology of these things and doing comparisons between them. Um, But uh, after that, I also looked at ichthyosaurs more generally, including all of them and trying to work out how they were all related to each other using a combination of morphology again, um, but also various statistical and uh, computational techniques to build essentially an ichthyosaur family tree. Um, which was published fairly recently. Uh, I think it came out in early December, which was a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of frustration because that's how these things often go. But I'm very happy to see it out. Uh, could we see that one if we put it on the website? You can the do, yes. Tree? Cool. Uh, yes, so there's the paper that came out, which we can, I'm sure we can link to if you really want to read 27 pages of... <laughs> Lots of stuff. Um, and yes, so there's lots of trees and pictures and things in there with some colour too. Excellent. And so for those of us who are unfamiliar with ichthyosaurs, can you explain to us what they were? Well, I can try my very best. <laughs> um, I can't promise to necessarily give you every detail. Um, so the word ichthyosaur comes from the Greek uh, ichthyos and sauros, meaning fish lizard, which describes them pretty darn well because they're reptiles, lizard-like things, but they actually end up looking quite a lot like fish. Um, so we know they're reptiles by comparing their anatomy and so uh, and also their close relatives and the similar uh, animals like that. However, we don't know exactly where they fit into the general reptile tree. Um, ichthyosaurs first appeared in the early Triassic around about 250 million years ago. The oldest ones are known from China around that time, but they seem to have spread world ro- worldwide, or at least around um, the uh, Panthalassic Ocean, as it was at the time, um, fairly quickly. Um, but they already seem to be fairly well adapted to uh, a marine realm, having a fish-like or at least eel-like body form generally, with paddle-like limbs and some semblance of a tail fin, suggesting that they were spending a lot of their time in water. And in the early Triassic around this time is when you have a lot of other different reptile groups also evolving uh, into an uh, aquatic lifestyle. So Sauropteridians is another group, and these include not early on, but later on, uh, things such as plesiosaurs, which are the large four-flippered Loch Ness Monster type animals, although I'm sure Fian will prefer me not to mention the Loch Ness Monster in this context. (laughs) Many people will get annoyed for that. Um, And various other uh, groups evolving at the same time. And because a lot of them end up being so different so early on, that means it's quite difficult to sort of work out exactly how they're related to each other, which ones are more closely related, which ones evolved slightly earlier, came uh, slightly further down the tree and the like. But um, we've got enough comparisons and bones of of the ichthyosaurs to be certain that they are somewhere within reptiles. Um, As I say, they evolved early early in the Triassic, very soon after the uh, end Permian mass extinction. This is the, the largest mass extinction that we have seen in the... Uh, fossil record, at least the last half billion years or so. Um, I don't know whether there's a programme about that elsewhere on Paleocast. Uh, yes, there is. There is. So I'm sure Dave, Dave will be able to tell people about that. I think it's episode out. 23? Yeah. 
You've you been can... doing this too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, were they always kind of ichthyosaur-like? Was there any, um, you know, like really long neck versions or ones that have really long tails? Or are they all kind of morphologically conservative, always kind of doing the same thing? Um, so they weren't necessarily conservative. They evolved in different ways to other marine reptiles. So I mentioned plesiosaurs earlier, so everyone will recognise this as the Loch Ness Monster with four flippers and a long neck. And some plesiosaurs had long necks, some of them had short necks and big heads. Um, Ichthyosaurs, to a certain extent, did not do that. So we don't see any ichthyosaurs with excessively long necks, for instance. Um, However we do see morphological changes through the evolution of ichthyosaurs. So the earliest ichthyosaurs were very uh, long, long, sort of thin, rather eel-like things, um, with, but still had um, paddle-like limbs and various other adaptations to this aquatic lifestyle. But they were sort of halfway between a more ancient lizard-like form and uh, the sort of later, very fish-like form we see in um, Jurassic and Cretaceous ichthyosaurs. So early on, we have these relatively small, about a metre or so long, uh, eel-like ichthyosaurs. But within about, I guess, 10, 15 million years or so, they do evolve a myriad of forms. So we get much larger ichthyosaurs. The Fairly early on, we get up to five or eight metres, Um, But in the late Triassic, around about 230 million years ago, we get up to the really the largest ichthyosaurs. And these include some of the largest marine reptiles that we found, um, such as the the giant ichthyosaur, ichthyosaurs, uh, Shonosaurus and Shastasaurus, which could grow 15 metres or 20 metres long each. So these were very much the the whales of the early Triassic, although they didn't necessarily exactly feed in the same way. They weren't filter feeders or um, the like that we see with whales. They seem to have still been eating larger prey, um, other marine reptiles or large fishes, for instance. Um, But at the same time or a similar time, we do also get, again, much smaller ones. So we get small ichthyosaurs like Mixosaurus, which are about a metre long or even less. And these seem to have been remaining in the shallow waters. They had a very um, dura, um, a very durable dentition, lots of low rounded teeth, which seem to be adapted to eating lots of animals with shells. So small mollusks, um, clams, potentially sea snails and things like that. Um, So during the middle and late Triassic, between around about 245 and uh, 220 million years ago, we have a large diversity of ichthyosaurs and they were also occupying different niches all the way from small ones feeding in the shallows on invertebrates, mollusks and things through to uh, these large, um, these larger either uh, sort of big whale-like ones or even very predatory ones with big teeth that were eating other large marine reptiles. And that goes on for a bit. However, when we come to the end of the Triassic, around about 200 million years or so, we lose a lot of this diversity. And this is a time of a, another mass extinction. Again, one of the, the big fives from big five mass extinctions from the last 500 million years or so. Um, and so going across the end of the Triassic into the Jurassic boundary, we seem to only get one lineage of ichthyosaurs pass, passing through that. Um, and these are what's known as parvopelvia, and these are the sort of more classic, very fish-like ichthyosaurs. They've got short, relatively rotund bodies. They've got very well-developed uh, forelimbs for um, inter-paddles, for um, either stability or helping with motion. And many of them also have a, a well-developed tail fin. So this is where the vertebral column has actually bent down. And uh, at the back of the tail, you get a very crescent-like tail fin, much like that you would see in a tuna or an ocean-going shark. And so that means that from the Cretaceous, uh, sorry, from the Jurassic and then going into the Cretaceous from about 200 million years ago through to 90 million years ago, many ichthyosaurs end up having this very similar body plan, a very fish-like body plan, very tuna-like body plan. That doesn't mean to say that they didn't have lots of 
um, differences between them. They were still occupying various niches. So you had small ones which were probably feeding on small fish, medium size which may have been feeding on medium sized fish, other smaller marine reptiles. And then again, even larger ones like Temnodontosaurus being one, which was a macro predator. So that would have been eating large marine reptiles. Marine reptiles smaller than it, but as it grew up to eight or so meters, pretty much everything was smaller than it. So it could have had anything that it wanted to. But then, so that continued through much of the Jurassic Cretaceous. You get sort of variations on a theme type thing. Um, the Cretaceous record from around about 145 million years ago through to 90 million years ago is uh, less well studied, although we're starting to see that there does seem to have been quite a diversity within that as well. And sort of matching all of these different ecologies, these different niches that ichthyosaurs were filling. However, when you get to around about 90 million years ago, we seem to have a decline in ichthyosaurs and then they become extinct. So this is in the sort of in the middle of the Cretaceous, around about 25 or so million years before the dinosaurs became extinct. Um, there's no sort of associated meteorite impact or um, obvious volcanism or similar with this extinction event. Although we do see that various other groups become extinct at about the same time, both other large marine reptiles, as well as also their potential, their potential prey. And so while research in this is still ongoing, because it's sort of been neglected for quite a lot of uh, ichthyosaur research time, um, it does seem to be a combination of major climatic change, major sea level change, as well as this sort of um, general decline in ichthyosaurs around that time, uh, altogether contributed to the eventual extinction of this otherwise very successful group. Anything to add to that, Fionn? Has, has think, Ben missed anything? I don't think out? it'd be possible to add anything. That was a beautifully detailed history of the entirety of ichthyosaurs. Feel free to cut out as much as you need. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing that I would like to ask, uh, Fionn, you found a really, really small ichthyosaur, a little juvenile one. Do we know anything about how they were born and how they grew? Uh, we do, yeah. So thankfully, there are a number of spectacular fossils that have been found, um, some throughout the UK, but particularly at uh, Holzmaden in Germany, that show, um, well, for example, there are some that have embryos within the body cavity, um, a number that have embryos sort of ejected out of the body cavity. Um, but there's, interestingly, um, at least one that has an embryo sort of semi, semi-ejected from the body cavity, but with the head still in. And so all of this evident, evidence points to them being viviparous, so actually giving birth to live young, at least at this point in Ichthyosaur evolution. So by this point, um, as Ben was describing earlier, you know, this is, is quite far on in their evolutionary history. Um, but by this point, they had adapted so beautifully to living in water that they were giving birth to their young in water rather than the um, tactic taken by a number of other marine reptiles, such as turtles, where they have to very cumbersomely drag themselves out of the water up onto the beach and lay eggs, which for anyone who's watched footage of a turtle doing that or has been lucky enough to go and see it, is an incredibly energetic and costly thing to do. So to evolve the ability to actually give birth to your young in water is a remarkable adaptation to being an aquatic organism. So there's very good direct evidence that at least by the early Jurassic, they were giving birth to live young. Well, it's, it's not just um, from the early Jurassic. There's specimens of even some of the very early ichthyosaurs, um, a, uh, an ichthyosaur called Chowhusaurus, which is known from China in about 247 million years ago, I think it was, which also contains embryos within it. Um, of several young, showing that even the very earliest ichthyosaurs had apparently evolved the ability to give birth to live young. So these are some of the very first evolving ichthyosaurs and within less than, within about five million years or so of this mass extinction, which seemed to have sort of decimated the previous diversity of uh, animals on land and led to a new diversity forming. We have the evolution of this uh, remarkable body plan, which is adapted to moving in water, as well as these various different um, uh, functional changes or anatomical changes and the like, which allows them to remain in the water entirely. We have, uh, there's also somewhat of information about the ontogeny of ichthyosaurs as well. 
Um, so that's how they that's developed how, from young to adult. Precisely, yeah, how, essentially how they grew. Um, and particularly in areas like Lyme Regis, which is the focus of this show, um, there have, there's been such a history of collecting, over 200 years of collecting now, that there's such a range of specimens that you have individuals from across the age spectrum. So you have very large individuals, complete kind of eight metre ichthyosaurs, the, the temnodontosaurs, things like that, but also adults of um, other genera, um, ichthyosaurus particularly. Um, but we have juveniles as well, and it shows how the body changes um, as they grow. So a particular characteristic is that they had particularly large heads relative to the body size when they're very young. So the, the embryos and the newly hatched specimens that have been found have enormous heads. So they, you know, they look ridiculous, to be honest. The, the head's half the length of the body. And the very young ones, again, the head just looks slightly out of proportion to the rest of the body, which is a, a classic kind of juvenile characteristic. So we can see that that happens. And then as they get uh, grew older, got much larger, um, the rest of the body seems to grow relatively uh, quicker compared to the head. Well, not quicker, but the head gets smaller relative to the rest of the body. So we can say some things about how ichthyosaurs grew and we have the fantastic evidence about the fact that they gave birth to live young. So there's quite a lot of information out there in the fossil record. So smaller, bigger heads and bigger eyes would they have had? It, I think so, yeah, relatively. Again, the, the embryo fossils have enormous eyes. Yeah, so um, in most of the either the embryo fossils or even the recently born infants, you do have extraordinarily massive eyes. Ichthyosaurs, or some ichthyosaurs in particular, are well known for having large eyes relative to the size of the skull, the size of the body in general. Um, in fact, some ichthyosaurs, like Ophthalmosaurus, have the largest eye relative to the body of any animal. And another ichthyosaur, Temnodontosaurus, has just the largest eye of any animal that we've ever found in the fossil record. So this is an eye which is going to be uh, about 26 or 28 centimetres in diameter. So the size of a, well, larger than the size of a football, if you can, if you could imagine that. Um and Got a lot of American listeners, so they might so have a different idea. Just, an, <laughs> yeah, just not the shape of American people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the eye is one of the one of the big characteristics of ichthyosaurs, um, particularly Jurassic and Cretaceous ichthyosaurs. Um, but it's sort of taken a bit to the absurd in their juveniles. When you see, if you see a skull of a juvenile ichthyosaur, then you can see that the eye just takes up the entire side of it. Um, so it's even relatively bigger in the, the youngest of them. I'm, I'm just thinking that these are the characteristics that we recognise now in cute animals. So ichthyosaur young were stereotypically cute looking. Oh, possibly. I mean, baby dolphins are pretty cute, aren't they? Yes. I, I don't know whether they would have quite had the the sort of sweet fluffiness and <laughs> probably you might, not you might expect Fluffy from a, yeah. a puppy or anything like that but i guess if you're if you're if your idea is a sort of a small fish with giant eyes then <laughs> yeah yes it would be cute well they were reptiles so are there any cute reptiles i mean turtles are pretty cute baby turtles, oh, yeah, especially. Baby they're, turtles they're about cute. as cute oh, as you yeah, get so, so. Perhaps. i'd say probably yes okay and you mentioned dolphins now there's a thing with ichthyosaurs and dolphins, they look incredibly similar and they're often used to explain what convergent evolution is. Uh, can you explain why they are similar and what the term convergent evolution means? Okay, yeah, so convergent evolution is a, it's a classic term that's kind of thrown about a lot, but what it means essentially is groups that are not particularly closely related evolving similar responses to similar issues, similar problems. So evolving adaptations to uh, to solve a problem, so perhaps living in an environment or feeding in a particular way. Um, and evolution sort of finds or uses similar strategies to overcome potential issues. So with this one, it's the, um, the issues surrounding evolving to live in an aquatic environment having been a terrestrial animal originally, so becoming secondarily aquatic. And this means things like changing your body shape, changing the way the body moves, changing the way you feed. Um, and there are better ways and worse ways for this to happen in terms of adaptations. And evolution tends to use the same solutions to the same top problems over and over again. 
Yes, and so in the case of, as you mentioned, ichthyosaurs with dolphins, um, in both cases, these are aquatic animals that have evolved from a land-living ancestor. In the case of ichthyosaurs, they evolved from some sort of ancient, vaguely lizard-like reptile um, into fish-like uh, aquatic animals, whereas in the case of dolphins, they evolved from, if you go back far enough, some sort of shrew-like mammal-type thing. Um, mammal thing through, uh, again, evolving into an aquatic thing. But the convergence is not just because they both live in water. Um, from the morphology and the uh, anatomy that we do find, we can infer that they actually were also living in the same way, not just in water, but they were also eating similar prey. Both had a largely fish-based diet, um, ichthyosaurs and dolphins, uh, also with the ability to hunt squid. So some dolphins today do hunt squid, which are very fast-moving, highly agile prey. In the Jurassic, you find several uh, ichthyosaur specimens which are full of um, fossil called belemnites. So these are these were squid-like animals, um, but they also preserve a hard internal shell-like thing, which is uh, lost in modern squid. So we find several ichthyosaur specimens full of lots of these. Uh, belemnite remains, showing that they did, eat, in some cases, eat a lot of belemnites, perhaps enough to eventually kill them, as we do see some ichthyosaurs which are completely rammed full of the, the things. So, um, so yes, in this case, we do get uh, convergent morphology, so the shape of ichthyosaurs and dolphins looking very similar, um, because of both living in an aquatic or marine environment, as well as having similar hunting uh, or similar... Uh, ecological strategies, hunting, swimming around and the like. Um, we do see some differences, however. So the most obvious one uh, is that um, ichthyosaurs keep their hind limbs. So ichthyosaurs have four paddles, two large front limbs and two relatively smaller hind limbs. So these hind limbs are in the process of being reduced. They're getting smaller through evolution. But all ichthyosaurs keep four limbs. Whereas in dolphins, and whales more generally, they have lost their hind limbs almost entirely. Um, certainly they don't have any external presence. If you look at a dolphin, you can only see two paddles, two limbs at the front. Um, if you look at the skeletons, you can see sort of the remains of very tiny bones in some of the whales, uh, which are all that remain of the hind limbs. So they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there in the middle of the animal because they haven't been lost completely. But they have been they have been reduced, so they're not actually visible on the outside of the animal. The other major difference that we see between whales and dolphins is sort of the orientation of the tail fin. So if you look at an ichthyosaur side on from either the left or right side, then you'll see the, the tail fin there as a as a crescent shape at the end of the tail. Whereas in whales and dolphins, you have to look from the top down or the bottom up to see that. So it's essentially the, the tail fin has been rotated 90 degrees between ichthyosaurs and dolphins. Uh, it's not entirely certain why that is. My sort of suggestion would be that many reptiles move around with a lateral motion along the, the vertebral column, along the spine meaning that this would be a, uh, a natural evolution for a vertically aligned tail, whereas many mammals move with a dorsal ventral movement along the spine, meaning that you would want a horizontal tail. But I don't know whether anyone's actually looked at that to show it or not. Uh, not sure. Another key difference in terms of dolphins, whales and ichthyosaurs that's I think some that's often overlooked because it's not such a, a visually ob obvious one is that of the sensory systems. So we were talking about how ichthyosaurs have these fantastically huge eyes. So obviously vision was incredibly important to their hunting, to their life generally. Um, with dolphins and whales, we find that they have things like echolocation being incredibly important. So um, they have this uh, organ at the top of their head called the melon, which is used to, um, to amplify sound waves, to echolocate. And we don't see this in ichthyosaurs. So... Although they were feeding on similar prey, they were obviously detecting the prey in very different ways. So we're having this interview today because you've both just been involved in producing an Attenborough documentary, uh, which will release tomorrow evening at the time of recording. Uh, so what's it all about? So 
this documentary revolved around a new fossil discovery made um, around a year and a half ago by uh, fossil collector Chris Moore down on the Jurassic Coast. Um, who uh, Chris is a fantastic collector who's been doing it virtually his whole life. He's one of the most experienced fossil collectors um, I've ever met and has found some remarkable things. And he found the paddles of this ichthyosaur in a fallen block on the beach um, and instantly knew that they were something special, something different. He's obviously found dozens before and he, you know, he knows when something's spectacular. And luckily he found where these paddles had come from in the cliff. They were in a big limestone block and he could match up to the layer where they had fallen from. And so from this, he could work out the rest of the animal was still in the cliff. And this then led on to David Attenborough getting involved because he's always had a very keen interest in paleontology and specifically uh, paleontology down on the Jurassic coast. So um, he's always been interested in collecting down at Lyme Regis. And when he found out about this, um, he and Chris have, uh, they've known each other for years and they chat fossils all the time. Um, he thought it'd be a great idea to essentially make a program about extracting this fossil, the process of extracting it, and then the process involved in preparing a fossil like this, which is very time consuming and very skilled work. And then also doing a lot of science on it. So um, once the fossil was extracted and removed, figuring out what we could learn about it uh, using modern scientific techniques. Mm. So I became, or I was first contacted in the middle of uh, 2016. So this was after Chris had found the paddles initially, which uh, came a bit earlier in that year. Um, and when he, David and the BBC were starting to get on the idea of making this documentary, I was contacted by the person who was uh, setting up to produce this. This was before the programme had been commissioned. So they were uh, contacting experts to see, um, or to say essentially, we've got this, potentially got this new specimen. Um, we're sort of looking at what new cutting edge science can we uh, attempt to do on it so that we can try and find out how it was living, uh, the environment that it was in, how it was moving around, interacting with all of the environment and the animals around it. Um, so I guess I was fortunate that this is one of the things that I've been working on in my PhD and postdoctoral research to try and put this together. I think um, the producer found me initially through my blog, which I'm sure Dave will be happy to link to. Of course. Um, I, which I occasionally update, as in every two years or so. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like PaleoCast. <laughs> Wait, I think you uh, beat me a little bit on that sort of frequency. So uh, I should mention that at the point at which I was contacted... Um, as I said, the programme hadn't been commissioned. This was just research. But equally, they hadn't actually found the rest of the fossil yet. So Chris had found the paddles at the bottom of the beach. He had an idea of where they were coming from in the cliff, but hadn't. I, I, he probably had been up, but hadn't actually been able to find confirmation of this. And so it was only later when the BBC did commission the programme and the sort of, they were finally going ahead with trying to find the sixth theatre sort that they then said... We need to go and get to this cliff, find out where the where the thing is, and try and get it out of there. And that's where Fian spent a, a, a week or so. Was it two weeks? Two pretty weeks much. Of two weeks hanging off one, the edge of a cliff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good fun. So I got involved, um, actually not um, in a research capacity. First of all, so because I'm I'm good friends of Chris, um, he told me about the fossil, and I was aware that at some point it would need excavating. But initially I wasn't aware that it was going to be made into a programme. So I always said that I would help him excavate it because um, I've, I've helped him on a number of excavations. He's helped me. It's just the way things work down on the coast is everyone kind of helps everyone else. And um, so when the programme got, uh, got commissioned and they decided that they were going to extract the fossil, he got back in contact with me and got me involved. And so I was down there initially as a bit of a bit of a grunt, you know, just down there on the sledgehammer, basically taking, I think we figured out somewhere between 20 and 30 tonnes of overburden off of the layer in which the ichthyosaur was found. So this was right at the top of the cliff, but there were years of old cliff falls sitting on top of it and we had to remove all of that. Uh, so where did that go? Down Just down, the, the down onto the beach, eventually into the sea. So right. we cordoned off the beach where we were doing it and um, essentially used that to to drop everything down over the side, much like a natural cliff fall would. So by the end of it, it looked very much like a small natural cliff fall. But incredibly, there were a couple of storms, uh, one during and a couple after the, the dig, and within a few weeks, you couldn't tell 
anything had happened. It was all washed away, disappeared. Now that's the nature of an incredibly rapidly eroding coast. It disappears, well, sometimes overnight on a big tide of a storm. And this was part of the reason that we had to do the excavation sort of quite soon after finding where the fossil was, because all it would take would be one big cliff movement and the whole thing could be destroyed, could be smashed up into pieces on the beach. Um, and so it's, it sort of becomes a race against time when you find one of these things to actually safely extract it. So I was involved in that capacity, first of all, to, um, to help out on the excavation. But then during the excavation, we noticed that the ichthyosaur was not only beautifully articulated and so all the bones in their right place, but also we noticed that it had a, a thin organic layer, so a soft tissue layer, which uh, we later found out was skin on the animal. And because my research revolves around looking at colour in animals, which is preserved often within the skin or hair or feathers, um, this led on to me being able to look at the soft tissue, look at the skin of this animal in a research capacity, and then help us to learn a little bit more about what colour patterns the ichthyosaur might have had. So I started off getting involved in the excavation, but serendipity and the fact that this had soft tissue on it led to me also being involved in a research capacity. And then also on the scientific consultancy side, um, along with Ben, uh, sort of helping get the science right on the show. Okay, so Fian got his beautiful face on telly. Ben, was the same true for you? Did you get to be involved or were you just advising? Uh, so initially, uh, I was uh, sort of like Fian, I was advising various things. Um, but I did eventually get my, my spot on the show to my sort of five minutes of sitting next to David and having a nice natter. Um, so following the discovery and the excavation of the sick theosaur, um, Chris Moore, the collector, spent a large amount of time preparing it. Uh, he had some help with this, um, and there's quite a good uh, time-lapse uh, video of this in the, the documentary as well. Um, but essentially that means a painstaking amount of time chipping all of the excess rock away, f away from the bones um, with the idea that we wanted to go on, look at the anatomy of this specimen, uh, try and work out whether it belonged to any known species of ichthyosaur or the possibility of whether it could be an ichthyosaur, uh, could be a new species of ichthyosaur. So Chris had noticed um, that the paddles were unusual. They were different to any other ichthyosaur that he'd collected over the past many years and any other that he knew about being collected by other people. Um, so we wanted to use that and we also wanted to compare it with the rest of the skeleton, um, trying to see how this, whether this was a known species or a new one, as I said. Um, but also because we had this very complete and fully articulated ichthyosaur. We were looking at, uh, or we were looking at trying to do more to reconstruct the ichthyosaur as a whole. We had hoped to find the whole ichthyosaur, but spoiler alert, that didn't turn out to be the case. So unfortunately, it was missing a head. Uh. Um, so the whole skull had gone. It seemed to have been nipped, uh, well, taken clean off. And, it's being, he dropped it down. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll, find it, yeah. we'll find it in, in his collection somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the end, end of the day, just <laughs> yeah. back of the rucksack. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, we we wanted to try and get as much uh, information out of this ichthyosaur as possible. So using a combination of sort of tried and tested techniques from the last two centuries, which essentially boil down to looking at the thing with your own eyes. So doing the basic observation, which is sort of the, the cornerstone, the bread and butter of science. Um, but because this is one side of the bones in a, a bit of rock, that makes it quite difficult to try and rebuild the animal altogether. While we had the whole animal all there, or apart from the skull, all of the bones were there in mostly in their right places. There were some bits where bones had been moved or broken, uh, including some interesting part where the uh, the limbs were found separately and they seemed to have been separated completely from the body, which is quite interesting. But to try and put it all back together, um, we wanted to be able to create a 3D model of this. And so to do that, we kindly got uh, Mark Mavro Gordato at the University of Southampton to put them put the specimen into their mega very large CT scanner. So uh, CT scanner, the CT stands for computed tomography, um, is very much like what you will have in a hospital when you go, for instance, for a brain scan or an internal scan. Essentially, we're using 
uh, x-rays going through the the um, specimen in this case Arichthyosaur to try and work try and see what the internal internal bits are i e see whether we can find the bones that you can't see just from the outside. So we can do this because the bones are chemically slightly different, which means they interact with the x-rays slightly differently from the rock around it. And so by doing that and taking lots of CT scans at slightly different angles, we can put them all together and make up a full three-dimensional model of the whole of the ichthyosaur. Initially, this is all as you see in the rock. So the bones have been flattened into an almost two-dimensional plane. Some bits are broken, some bits have been moved away from where they would have been in life. But by using computer software, we can essentially pull the bones out of the rock, reconstruct them back to their original three-dimensional form, and then, like a giant 3D jigsaw, just slot them back into the, the place that they would have been in life. It takes a, a lot of time and many computer crashes to <laughs> get to get to the final stage but fortunately we had two excellent interns who were Kelly and Kelly Vargas and Joe Flannery Sutherland working uh, many hours over the summer um, taking all of the CT scan data of which there was quite a lot um, pulling the bones out of it and then putting it all together to make a as far as we can get a uh, the most accurate or one of the most accurate three-dimensional skeletons of an ichthyosaur that have been so far created we do have the problem that it doesn't have a skull. Chris has been searching on the beach ever since he initially found the paddle. Continue so to search day, day in, day out. He's there it's, now. <laughs> quite probably. And I imagine we'll a phone call in a minute. With the, the storms recently, he's sort of hoping that there might be even more attempt of it. But so the skull is sort of a, a really important bit. It's the bit where the brain houses. It's the bit where the eye are. It's the bit where the animal feeds. And so because it does a lot of sensory, a lot of... Um, ecological functional stuff you can tell quite a bit about an animal from that we didn't have that so there were many things that we couldn't do conclusively for the ichthyosaur that Chris had found but there were still uh, lots of things that we could uh, try and get out of it so we could still make an attempt to try and work out whether this was a new species of ichthyosaur or not and we can still try and look at how it um, we've got the body so we can look at how it would have potentially swam and that we can get an approximation of the size of it as well, and various other still relatively important features like that. So was this specimen representative of a new species? So it was a little bit of a task to try and sort this out. Um, as So Chris had found these very unusual pair of paddles, and we found this rather spectacular fossil. It turned out in the end it was... Uh, almost fully complete. It was highly articulated. Pretty much everything was there except for the skull. Um, and so taking various features, looking at the configuration of the paddle, looking at the um, configuration of the shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle and uh, things like that, as well as the vertebral column, it does seem to be different enough from other ichthyosaurs known from Lyme Regis at the same time to represent a new species. Um, Again, the skull is one of the more useful things in trying to determine this. So have, not having the skull meant that it became more difficult because you didn't have half of the features that you would like to compare. However, considering the size of the animal, which is much larger than other, other similar ichthyosaurs from Lyme Regis, considering the relative size, shape, and the num sheer number of bones in the paddle, it does seem to represent something that is different from everything we know about so far? Or would you like me to just say yes? <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> so you're both scientific advisors, but you didn't have, uh, you didn't write the documentary, you didn't have final oversight of it. So looking at it now, how, how would you rate the science in the show? Is it, is it good enough? I, th I think it's really good. I think certainly in terms of the reconstruction that uh, that we've managed to do for it is, I think, the most accurate and scientifically informed that's been done. So it's particularly the um, the CGI model. We put a lot of work into that. So um, right from the get-go with the CGI company, we were advising 
about the the overall anatomy, the the skin texture, the movement, the coloration, everything. And they were liaising with us constantly throughout the whole process. So this wasn't, you know, we showed them a picture of an ichthyosaur and they went away and six months later came back with an ichthyosaur. It was very much a scientific method. It was a scientific process of getting every aspect as accurate as we could and backwards and forwards. So in that regard, I'm 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 impressed with what's come out of it. With um, the the CGI and the the models that you see in the documentary and the animations, um, that was sort of because of the time it takes to do CGI. It was going on around the same time as we were doing the CT scans and the three D reconstruction of Chris's ichthyosaur that forms the mainstay of the documentary. So while we didn't have the reconstruction ready to go straight into CG, we were both using that as we were going along building the reconstruction, as well as both as well as having knowledge of numerous other ichthyosaur fossils. So there are a huge number of ichthyosaur fossils out there and you can see lots of variety and shape. But um it does give you a very complete knowledge of how the animal would have looked. And so yes, as Fian says the animators were coming back to us we went through several different drafts of how the general shape of this is sorry my cats are just having a fight fight. just just carry on (laughs) so yeah there were several drafts of from the uh animators of what the ichthyosaur would look like initially from the shape looking at the general morphology and proportions how a fat or thin it would be tail size um trying to reconstruct the skull based on comparisons with other uh other specimens fossils that do have the skull preserved so right from the get-go there was this uh wanting to get the most accurate model that you could get um so that extended both from the initial shape of the thing through to getting the skin texture um doing reasonable suggestions for colors of the sixthius or color patternings and then going through to um onto how it would move swim and interact with the environment around it so the animation, I think, is one of the best I've seen for certainly ichthyosaurs and perhaps even swimming animals more generally. Because there's, swimming is a surprisingly difficult thing to animate because you've got to try and create a whole body motion from that um, in a relatively efficient, sleek-looking um, manner. And uh, there are animations out there that I don't think have managed it properly because they've ended up looking a bit slightly wonky to me mm. there was there was one glowing review that uh, that happened during the making of the show um which was when it was being sort of passed backwards and forwards between uh, the editorial department and the people at the bbc who basically commissioned this thing and uh, you know oversee the whole thing um one of the drafts that went went to them came back and the director said apparently so um what did you think of the cgi and the people who just watched it said, what CGI? <laughs> so they they didn't notice that it was actually a computer-generated model because when it was in amongst some other footage of sharks and uh, dolphins, it was so lifelike that actually they didn't realise it was computer-generated. So that's a fairly glowing yeah. review. So that, the animators on this spent a, a lot of time doing this. They were, they were uh, well, they had, I guess it must have been around about six months or so to do the animations for the whole programme. And for much of that, they were doing every day in a week and weekends and evenings throughout that as well, trying to get the best animations they can complete it. Even So it's only a a few short segments throughout the whole documentary, which do actually have these um, computer-generated animations in. But the amount of time spent doing this sort of gives you an idea, hopefully, of how good as... So it's not an easy thing to do, but it's certainly a lot of commitment and a lot of time and energy to put into it. That's actually it's, it's an interesting point about the show generally. Obviously, everything is condensed down into a one hour documentary, but the amount of work that went into each individual section is phenomenal. And having been involved in the whole background process and seeing the amount of work that's put in has been quite eye opening. So from the start, the excavation, two weeks work, that was actually probably the shortest job of the whole thing. The preparation of the fossil took Chris and his team, I, th- I believe it was six six months at least, if not more. Um, and then each of the bits of science that we've we've done on it um, and various other people have done, again, it's many months worth of work. And all of these things are condensed down into a couple of minutes in the show. And I think perhaps people might not realise just the amount of legwork that goes into it all. So the, the skin pigmentation uh, research that I was working on 
that represents around about four or five months of looking at samples of this ichthyosaur. Um, and I know that the other work, the CT scanning and the uh, the reconstructions, is all many, many months of work. That said, you're the experts, you know these animals better than anyone else. Um, did you see anything that was wrong in the final thing or that was a half-truth? And I don't mean that as a criticism of the documentary, but um, in the way that these things are made, we can't be expected that um, people who don't know about these animals uh, are going to get everything right. So is there anything that you spotted? I can't think of anything that was fairly obvious. So uh, doing this here now, Fian and I have seen a rough cut of this um, from a couple of months ago. So we haven't seen the final documentary. There shouldn't have been, I don't think there would have been much change, but we haven't seen the exact final bits that everyone is doing the voiceover. We haven't heard David's voiceover, for instance, or the final CGI animations. Um, during the sort of uh, the year or so of actually doing the making of the programme itself from just after commission through to getting towards the end, um, I certainly was contacted by the producers who were doing the script, essentially, for the programme as a whole, both in sort of the organising the structure of it, as well as what exactly different people, particularly David, would be saying at various points. So this was written by a combination of people, David, the producers, as well as my input to make sure that the content in there was as accurate as possible. And as far as possible, also things were tried to make, be made clear, but not becoming wrong because of that. So there's uh, sort of the difference between the technically correct scientific way of saying it, which can have quite a lot of jargon, versus the way that many other people will, what the much easier way to understand, which doesn't necessarily have that. Um, it doesn't have all of the details in it, but it's still correct because of that. And so trying to build build the script as you go along and include all of the necessary detail, making sure that the whole programme itself has everything so you don't miss out chunks, but that you don't end up making a programme is five days or so long to include every tiny piece in it. It was actually quite fun and it's very interesting to see the process of how you generally build up from small ideas going through to trying to include what's uh, the science and the various technical details that you need to, but then condensing it down for the more general audience who is not trained in all of the very specific details in this. I was, I was impressed and pleased with the the amount of dialogue that, that goes on behind the scenes with a show like this. So everything was under constant discussion and um, constantly evolving. So we were very much involved throughout with, as Ben was saying, with the script, with the science and everything, but it was very much backwards and forwards. It was bouncing off the scientists, off the editor, off everyone else working on it, off of Chris. Um, so it was, a, it was a real kind of open dialogue about the programme all the way through, which I found really, really interesting to see from behind the scenes. So, Fian, you've said that you've put six months of research into this uh, project. Mm -hmm. And Ben, I'm guessing you've probably put in a similar amount of mm -hmm. time and effort. Yeah. So did you get paid to contribute or was appearing on the documentary payments enough? <laughs> it would have been. We, uh, well, Personally, I was paid... Um, uh, partly for the dig and the consultancy, the work itself, the research was not in, in any way funded. So um, that was done. I'm, I'm hoping I can roll it up into my PhD itself. So um, that meant I could dedicate more of my time to it. Um, but in terms of the payment, that was for the consultancy rather than for the actual science in my case. Uh, and it was a similar one for me. So uh, again, I was paid for consultancy on the, the program. So I was able to dedicate some time, go to um, visit the specimens at various different museums and go into the Royal Veterinary College for scanning, as well as um, Southampton. Um, we also had two interns, uh, Kelly and Joe, who were working on the 3D reconstruction, and um, they did that for uh, two or three months or so. So they were paid for their time to be able to dedicate their full time to that also. Uh, and so that was so the BBC kindly let that uh, because the the schedule for the program was relatively tight. So it's quite impressive managing to get such a huge amount of work done in little over 
12 months, about 14 months in total or mm-hmm. thereabouts. I think don't tell the BBC Finance Office, but I personally certainly would have paid for the opportunity <laughs> that I uh-huh. you know, let alone being paid. I guess another one of the perks is that you might have got to hang out with uh, David Attenborough, Sir David, or we, Sir Dave to you guys, as well, you know. Uh, our mate Dave, yes. So we did have a... Uh, hello, cat. <laughs> Sorry, the cat is just walking in front of the microphone. Just trying to be part of it. Yes, smelly. And the other cat is using the uh, scratching mic. Yeah, excellent. So well, they all want to be part we've, of it. We've been invaded all going by on cats. At Dave's house. <laughs> I tell you what, you mentioned Sir David Attenborough and all the animals yeah. from all around are just there you go, straight yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, our, our mate Dave. So we did, um, as you can see, if you watch the documentary, we do have uh, our own snippets sitting next to Dave and discussing the, the research we went on. So um, Dave uh, came to the University of Bristol for a day to do uh, a large part of the, the filming for that. So um, covering... Fian's research um, on the skin colour, my research on the reconstruction, as well as um, Emily Rayfield's research, looking at the function of the, the large ichthyosaur. Um, so we hang up. We Yeah, we were around with Dave for the whole day. He had a nice lunch of cheese and ham sandwiches with him um, and a, a couple of cups of tea. There were good pastries. I did say uh, to Dave quite flippantly, but did you <laughs> do you actually call him... Did you actually call him Dave, or well, did you have to call him Sir David? I, I didn't. I didn't preface every sentence with Sir David or <laughs> Sir Attenborough. Well, I, <laughs> Mr. I Attenborough, on good authority, Sir he hates being called Sir. Yes. Well, he apparently has some some ridiculous number of um, honorary doctors. I think he's, honorary he's the most of any human. In the 20s. Yeah, so he's got you, one from Bristol, but he's got one from every university. Well, yes, you probably should call him Doctor, 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 and so on, Attenborough. <laughs> I think he'd prefer that. Yeah. <laughs> it's more concise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, as Ben was saying, got to meet him on the day of um, the filming for the science of the show, but I actually got to meet him, first of all, during the excavation. So he wasn't there for most of the excavation. I think it'd be fairly cruel to you know, get him hanging off the edge of the cliff with a sledgehammer. Although I'm sure he would have been quite game for it. Um, but on the last day of the excavation, he came along to look at what we'd done. So we we filmed um, with him on the beach, sort of lowering blocks down over the cliff, the last few bits of the ichthyosaur, and then um, uh, David and Chris were sort of examining the bones and talking about it. Um, so initially I didn't get to meet him because I was up on the cliff basically dangling these blocks over. I was you know, the winchman lowering them down, and I got to watch from afar. Um and then David had to be brought in by by boat, so because um, this was a mile and a half along the beach, uh, he travelled by boat. Um, and as we were finishing filming, and I was thinking, oh, I might get a chance to actually go down and meet him. Suddenly, the boat appeared and it rocked up to the beach, and David started walking towards him. Ah, oh, missed my opportunity, my chance to actually meet David. But luckily, the uh, the director sort of held up the boat and gave me a space on the boat, so I sort of charged down the cliff, did a what was normally a five minute walk in about 25 seconds throwing off all my safety gear as I went and then dived onto the boat and actually got to sit next to David for about sort of 35 minutes traveling back to the harbor just chatting with him you know talking about the research talking about the fossils which was certainly one of if not the highlight of my life thus far so it's tomorrow it's uh for you guys going to be what 22 21 hours until you see your documentary are the BBC doing anything special? Do you just have to sit and wait at home and watch it on telly like everyone else? Or do you get to go around to uh, Dave's house yeah. and all watch it and have a big well, party? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to bother watching it. Yeah. Well, there was <laughs> a, a programme on uh, Channel 4 about Dick Strawbridge building the longest model railway, which sounds Ooh, very interesting. I think we should go to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know about Fian. I assume as well. Yes, you were invited as well, weren't you? I, I hope so, yes. So, uh, yes, we've been invited to um, sort of the, the, I guess, tra- the, official, the official party, as far as you could call it, um, for the people, the BBC and the production company who who made the program going on, so we'll be um, having some drinks and nibbles and watching the program with all of the people who put it together. Of which I'm sure there are many more than we've actually met in person. It's going to be very intriguing actually, we, to we, meet all I of think, the, yeah. the other behind the scenes. We've met people. quite a few of them: um, Sally, Cassie, uh, Lucy, and Miles. 
um, are part of the production team. Um, and then, of course, there's also animators. There were the people who did the filming, sound recording, both on the beach, in mm-hmm. the various labs. Yeah, so you've got Robin, um, the, the, who's yes. been the cameraman throughout the whole thing. So yes. To see him again. And um, Chris, uh, Chris and the rest of the dig team are coming mm-hmm. up from Dorset to, uh, so to join in as well. So I suspect it's, it's going to be a packed house. I think it will. It'll be the first time that everyone who's been involved in the show will be together in one yes. room. Oh, sounds fun. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the BBC, it's the UK's communist TV uh, station, and we all have to pay, and this is where the money goes. You Whenever they... Oh, well, I don't pay, actually. Okay. Oh, have you now? I don't have You're a TV. You're not buying our drinks tomorrow. I don't have a TV licence. I, I can't actually watch your show without breaking the law. No. Well, we'll but, let you know how it is. But it's interesting that they have these kinds of parties whenever they release a show, which I think is pretty much their entire remit. So well, I don't know whether the BBC's paying for it. Ah, right, okay. No, it's, I'm sure it's... It's, probably, it's all on Dave. Dave's back pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, Dave has got the first yeah. round in. I'm, I'm sure we'll get there and we'll get the bill. <laughs> <laughs> so after the show is aired, uh, what is its legacy going to be? Have you been asked to do any kind of outreach or presentations, public lectures or anything around the show? Um, this weekend I've been asked um, to do a couple of media things for it so uh, short term um, promotion of it so uh, the Bristol Post I believe it is <clears throat> are writing a piece that uh, they did an interview for and I'm going to BBC Radio Studios on Monday morning to talk to BBC Radio Bristol about it um, so sort of short term promotional outreach but I've not yet been asked to do anything longer term but I think this really lends itself to something like going to schools um, and doing outreach to kind of engage the public with it. Yeah, I think uh, Fian's got the the perfect voice for radio with his uh, dulcet tones and all that. I sadly haven't been invited to do that. Well, I guess oh. sadly or fortunately, as I wouldn't be able to on Monday. Shall I send you my <laughs> stead? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so uh, both Fian and I have done some articles for the BBC because they've got a, a accompanying website for the programme that shows a few clips from the, the programme itself and then uh, the articles that Fee and I have done, which briefly covers the research with a few images that went uh, that sort of formed the basis for what we did within the documentary itself. Um, I've also been convinced to update my occasionally publishing blog with a sort of a, a little bit of what we've mentioned in here, a bit about the story behind the documentary as well as my contribution to the, the science behind it and a few other things like that. Um, and so there's certainly potential for, yeah, I think as I think this certainly lends itself again to opening the, the public's imagination again with paleontology, but also with paleontology that's right on their doorstep. The Jurassic Coast itself is already a popular place, but um, certainly lots of people can go to fossil hotspots all over the UK because there are just so many of them and you can go and find your own fossils that you can you can just pick up on the beach or in the in a uh, field or similar if you get the correct permissions um, and take home with you and display and then you can you will have the story of fossils that can be 100 200 or even more million years old um, to share with whoever comes over to stare at your mantelpiece. Okay, well, that just about rounds it all up. Thank you very much both for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin-Silverstone and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast, and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.